Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, um, final um, webinar of our, of our autumn series. This is the, the third webinar we've had on the topic of open science and open data. My name is David Mills, and I'm treasurer of the ESSA, and um, I'm um, in the, it, really pleased to be convening this with Monica. Monica um, Monica's going to share this chairing with me, but um, what, we, what we're hoping today is that we will open up a really difficult and important conversation um, for IASA about our relationship to the debates around what open data, open science might look like. And um, this is something which we've been exploring for the last couple of webinars, um, both in relationship to the European um, context and the report um, um, from the, the, the first webinar, which is about, about how European science is trying to respond and the Institute for Science in Europe. And then in the last webinar, um, thinking about open access and what that might mean for anthropology journals and what that might mean for anthropologists across the world. But today we're focusing on open data. And Monica, um, Monica, you, you've convened this um, great set of speakers. We've got three brilliant speakers today. So I'm going to ask Monica to, um, to, to come in and introduce them. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you hear me. I, I'm not going to be long in this introduction, just to, to say how important it is for us. Since in 2018, the Plan S has been signed, all of us researchers working in public institutions in Europe are concerned by it. So we are concerned by the necessity to open our anthropological data. And what it means open is not clear. What data means in anthropology? Is it uh, films? Is it our uh, photos? Is it other material? Or is it really our field, work, uh, field notes? Uh, is extremely important, not to mention how important it is to, to, to note what anthropology is about. Um, so nothing is clear in, in the opening of anthropological data in this injunction as we see it. But we need to discuss and during this period of transition to this open data in anthropology, we do have the space and, and even the obligation to engage in the discussion so that we do sort of shape what is going to be our realities in research for the next 20, 30 years at least. Um, so this is why we felt it was important. And in order to understand and to deconstruct some stereotypes about how um, uh, how this could impact anthropological research, we have invited three speakers today. And we will start with uh, uh, Katja Muller, uh, who has been working on online archives and in the field of uh, heritage, where actually they have been uh, prone even earlier than us to be confronted to, to, to the necessity to share uh, their data. Um, Katja Müller is Privat Dotentin for Social Anthropology at Martin Luther University in Halle-Wittenberg, and she's currently uh, a visiting professor at the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, so we shall start with her presentation, and then we'll move on to a presentation by Jessica Delage Healy and uh, to a presentation by, by James Rose, but we will introduce them as they come. So hello, Katja, and the floor is uh, to you. Hey there. Um, and thanks everyone for coming to um, the webinar. Um, thanks also for the invitation and for the setup. Um, I'll start straight away with my um, presentation on um, cultural heritage and its online form, um, and I and my in investigations into online archives. And um, with doing that, I'll I would like to first actually. Um, start with a definition um, of what I call digital archives and an explanation of why I use this term when I actually worked um, a lot with museums um, and collections. So I use the term digital archive when describing online collections of information relating to the past. So when I talk about online forms of collected repositories and a collection pretty much can be anything but when I call it an archive I um, draw on the historical development of the term archive and I stress the institutionalized information use because it's a focal point of digitizing museum collections. So having said that, I, I also um, tell you that the very narrow understanding of archives as paper records created by the government has been historically applied, yes, but it's no longer appropriate when we talk about archives. Um, and furthermore, I use the term because the heritage actors I used to work with, they use digital archive or online archive as an emic term. 
And um, where did I work? I worked mostly um, with Indian and some European digital archives between 2015 and 2020. I did classical fieldwork and digital anthropology. And I um, found that digital archives, this term can grasp the established notions of controlling information about the past, as well as the scrutiny of such notions. And I find this to be a, quite an appropriate um, term to investigate ideas of ordering and accessing information in depots I and mean, archives um, and how they have changed over time as well as to cover the differences and commonalities between digital and analog um, versions of what we call an archive, but I'm not gonna go into this, kind of like this digital um, analog differentiation or overlaps. Um, this is in the book that has been out with Berkhan um, two months ago um, called Digital Archives and Collection. But what I'll do um, here now is A, I'm gonna tell you briefly how the digital archive reached museums. Um, then I'm gonna you know, uh, explain what impact that has on archivists and curators in particular um, as regards the kind of new order that is a possibility through um, digitization. And the last point is whether this actually um, opens a dialogue. Um, so how did the digital actually reach museum or the idea of digitization? There are three um, sort of institutionalized bodies that I looked at. Um, the first is European museums and archives. And here essentially, it's this possibility of giving back information through online dissemination of ethnographic collections that is the main driver. So this, this is what has been called a digital return or digital repatriation, contested term, um, is pretty much what, what drove um, most European museums and archives to kind of think about digitization in the first place. Um, and here are just three examples um, that I looked at. Um, and the footnote is, as I mostly looked at um, India and South Asia, these examples obviously refer to content from India or South Asia. And my main interest was in photographs. So these are, again, examples um, that have a photographical um, collection. So you see at the top left, um, the British Library. It has about 15,000 prints, drawings, and photographs from South Asia online. Um, the Führer Heimdorf collection uh, is also in Great Britain with about 10,000 photographs from the Himalayas and India on display. And at the bottom, you see a screenshot from the Basel Mission Archive, which was actually one of the first um, online archives uh, regarding photography. It has about 12,000 photographs from India, but uh, in total about 60 or 70,000 photographs from all the places where the mission was active. So that is mostly Asia and Africa. What these archives tell about themselves on their websites, and I apologize if that's not easy to read, but the quotes uh, that I highlighted say, um, this online archive um, provides a unique historical, um, unique historical tool, a vivid evocation of the common cultural heritage forged by two centuries of interaction between India and Great Britain. This is what the British Library says. The Führer Heimdorf archive says that, quote, this project has turned this hidden archive into an online resource accessible to people across the world. And the Basel mission says, quote, the objective of the website is to foster encounters with and prompt questions about various kinds of transfer and circulation of ideas, knowledge, and values around the globe through space and time. So these self-characterizations display a post or decolonial thinking in these institutions, which manifests in our gears of opening up museums and archives and facilitating the online circulation of knowledge. In this context, um, and consequently mostly in ethnographic museums and collections, uh, decolonial or post-colonial thinking by now has, a, of course, a sound and widely acknowledged theoretical basis. Most of you will be quite familiar with the discussions and the debates around decolonialism and post-colonialism in Europe um, and beyond. Um, as regards online dissemination, I just posted a few keywords here. Um, Ruth Phillips said, you know, this might be a form of digital repatriation and indigenization. Paul Basu refers to this global mediascape that we're, you know, part of and that digitization in museums and collections and archives could be 
a way of circulating information, could be a way to support knowledge production beyond the museum sector, and could be a response to rupture. So when we turn now to uh, museums and archives in India, the situation is, of course, slightly different. The main driver here is, in the first place, a belief in improvement or development. And this is not just uh, the case for museums and archives, but this is an overall agenda in India, the so-called Digital India Agenda that the government has been implementing for the last 10 years, approximately, also took form and shape in museums and archives, in particular through introducing collection management systems. So CMS is the abbreviation that I use here for collection management systems, which are introduced with that thought or that idea of producing better workflows. Um, and it's not just it's not just the idea of um, improving the workflows in-house, but it's also seen as a prerequisite for online access. So um, there are, is a very good example um, of doing that, of pushing that forward. It was actually the Ministry of Culture in India that, in, that introduced a collection management system um, to, the, to 10 national museums. And they made it a necessity for these, or they kind of pushed for these 10 museums to digitize their full collections and to put them online while they're still in the process of digitizing that. So it's a very good example of several thousand images being online and the full collections being searchable um, in an online format. But I would not say that this is the exception to the rule, but it's still, you know, it's not as common as it, you know, could be or should be. There are, of course, also quite a few archives, museums and collections that don't put their collections online, so restricting access continuously. The Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, for example, digitized all their 20,000, no, sorry, 200,000 images, uh, but they're providing these only on in-house computers. The Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts also has a large photographic collection of famous photographers but they do not even have them accessible on the intranet. And the National Archives of India are another example of not having the digitization done in a way that it is accessible to people from the outside. European institutions, especially, or for example, these two that I mentioned from Britain, they might have an advantage when it comes to experience in conceptualizing and financing digitization pros projects. But again, um, regarding searchability and retrieval, um, the British Library and the Führer Heimdorf collection actually lag behind. Navigation to and through the collection uh, of the British Library is really a challenge. I don't know if any of you tried that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really a challenge. And search engine optimization kind of hinders you to actually find the Führer Heimdorf collection. Um, and this overall situation, which you know, undoubtedly it was worse a few years ago and there are new digitization projects on the horizon. So this this situation will improve further. But with that overall situation of still kind of, you know, a lack of access options to heritage material, um, a couple of people got active. And this is the third group, or yeah, third group that I'm trying, that I want to mention. It's new cultural heritage actors which got active. So, the, so um, people created their own digital archives um, as a form of protest and critique, and they based it on arguments of a lack and necessity, so lack of access, a lack of information provision. They based it on a narrative of um, access and sharing as intrinsic values that they promote, um, and to some extent also on a contestation of archival power. What impact do these um digitization oh these are two examples that i worked with sorry so one is the 1947 partition archive that i worked with quite closely and the indian memory project as well um so these two archives kind of created created um archives from scratch so to say so they started collecting material and then putting that online in an archival form creating a lot of entries um, and actually gathering quite a 
quite a huge um, crowd that interacts online on this uh, archival material in a form of memory making in online form. So that brings me now to the question of what actually does digitization um, have, what, what kind of impact does digitization have on archivists and curators? Um, the shift to using digital tools to order archival content has created a space to reconsider basic concepts of archival architecture. Um, and the, well, of course, it, it's related to, uh, to the computational data management, which allows you a way more diversified ordering system, specific inquiries, et cetera, et cetera. Rather than having registry books and index cards, um, you now have a, you know, a larger amount of um, categories that you could search and trace and that computers can handle quite easily. So a diversified ordering system is possible. But what's also possible is a, is a more unorthodox structure for archival material. Um, designing and implementing these databases means that you can consider not just the interest of custodians or researchers or an unspecific larger public, but what you also can do is to take the knowledge systems of so-called source communities or other stakeholders into account. And that might actually lead to different ontologies. Um, and the digital archival order can be different from what the archival order has been in its analog form, leading to the potential of creating um, real contact zones, to you know, use Clifford's or um, Fred's term. And there have been examples in the past of, of trying to trying to model that, trying to use the digitization as a form of creating alternative ontologies, alternative versions of how an archive is ordered, set up, who's having access and writing rights, for example. Um, Carl Hoxton and Emma Poulter are just um, two people that I would like to mention who tried um, to establish a contact network um, through hubs. And Kimberly Christen is another person who has in close collaboration with um, research communities um, drawn or sketched um, a particular way of a digital archive that takes a stance towards um, communities and their knowledge system. But still, um, all these models bear the potential for reinstalling authoritarian voices. We need to keep that in mind so um, that digital archives are not per se more democratic or leaning towards source communities. They all bear the potential of reinstalling or doing pretty much the same kind of restricting ordering system, applying this to the digital version of the same archive. So does it actually open um, a dialogue? Um, does the online access, the digitization, and then the um, online dissemination of heritage data foster the dialogue that uh, quite a few institutions envision in the first place? And the answer is yes and no. Some of the archives are really successful in creating an online audience and some of the archives are not some of the institutions museums and archives are not and the question is you know to some extent why is that the case um there are a couple of hindering aspects for opening dialogues and um these are well a as you know the decolonial or post-colonial debate is very heated um, especially when it comes to museums and restitutions and, you know, providing access is often seen as the first step for demands from um, communities that might just want the objects back, not just in a digital form, but in, you know, proper material form. Um, and the, yeah, you all know the debate, it's, it's quite heated. Um, which has led to some extent to a very slow pace, to a slowdown of um, creating access as an information provision in the first place. Um, another point is that the ideals might not be reached because a digital return implies, and I quote Kate Hennessy, the goal of bringing knowledge of the collection back to communities. So a digital return can be understood as a compromise in those situations where a physical return is demanded but not possible for political reasons. Um, it might be just a weak excuse 
Um, and the, but the digital at least helps establishing some form of indigenous control over cultural artifacts. Yet, as I said before, there's no automation um, of a democratization, neither is there an automation of an online dialogue taking place, whether within nationally bound communities nor across borders. So, hence, what do we actually see if, it, if um, a dialogue is happening? Um, there are various forms of engagement. The actual use takes, for example, the form um, of commenting on social network sites, of forming what Granovetta called weak ties. Um, it can also take the form of, well, emotion, emotional reactions to topics or people that are personally meaningful for individuals. We also see numeric impacts. The 1947 Partition Archive, for example, has about a million followers um, interacting online quite, quite lively, which indicates that digital archives can become relevant actors in cultural production and contribute to the historic canon. But there are also um, singular instances of meaningfulness. This is what Diana Marsh calls stories of impact which can be generated through digital archives and their online dissemination when people find new appropriations, new interpretations and meaning making where circulation is not as wide as regards numbers, but it's more internally um, or not visible online. And what could actually archives do in order to you know, foster um, the uh, digital uh, exchange, the online exchange on the basis of um, digital data is a, of course, a continuous social interaction, which is long and tiring and but essential and needed. So permanent sharing and communication is necessary, encouraging social interactions through mediators and interns and through their social networks, excuse me, proactively utilizing social media. And inclusiveness at the front end, so that regards the website design, the integration of social network sites, requesting people to co-create content. And probably one of the most important points is that archives should be emotionally touching and creating a meaningful involvement. So you should create empathy at a distance to some extent, rather than having just dry kind of lists of information. It makes more sense if you want to involve people to have a visual narrative approach or storytelling approach that creates empathy at a distance. And a post-colonial or decolonial agenda is also um, an advancing or positive factor. So to finish, I just want to say that I know that comparing the digital archives that I compare. So digital archives emanating from European collections that missionaries, administrators, anthropologists gathered several decades ago with collections referring to the same times and places, but but you know being um, assembled today is to some extent a comparison on uneven grounds. But the juxtaposition of these different digital archives opens up a space for rethinking the decolonial agenda as a digital return. It allows for better understanding of what intentions and demands are there as regards access to archival data and the production of digital archives. It can be you know, morally inclined response to rupture. It can be the idea of improvement through digitization as a better form of government. Or it can be a wish to diversify cultural production and the national canon. And with that, um, I'll stop and I thank for the attention and hand over to Monica and Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katia. You are reminding us that controlling archives and controlling all this anthropological data means also uh, controlling the past somehow, so the discussion is quite powerful when it comes to to to, to this. Um, also, thank you for uh, bringing up the fact that archivists and curators have been confronted to that since they started the digitalization, and now they are even more confronted to that than us as as um, as researchers. So there is a precedent there, and, and maybe we can have a dialogue with them to to know what has been going on and and what were the effects of this opening as it took place. 
Um, we may proceed directly to, 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 to Jessica Dallarchihiri presentation because she's going, she has been working for the past 20 years on uh, digital returns and uh, indigenous or archival practices among the Yolungu collectives in Northern Australia. Um, so she's going to provide us a, a, a different um, input and another way of thinking about this. So Jessica is a, is a researcher at the Center for National Research in France and one of my colleagues. Um, so I hand the floor to her. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to join this important conversation. Uh, I will raise many questions more than provide answers or solutions to uh, some of these um, issues. So for the past two years, um, I have participated in a research project called Anthropen, Anthropen with Monica and a team of colleagues, uh, librarian, archivists and other research support specialists from our research centre. As its full title indicates, we seek to critically examine the boundaries of anthropological data in the light of open access injunctions. I use the strong term of injunction or sometimes even exhortations to qualify the demands that are increasingly made on us, anthropologists and other social science researchers working for public institutions to partake in the broader open data movement, which is supported by our employing institutions and upheld by various national and international frameworks in the EU and elsewhere. While this is not uh, the place to develop uh, our findings in much depth, Suffices to say here to introduce my presentations that when the project started, I was met with skepticism. It was met with skepticism, not to say utter distrust, by many of our colleagues. In a country that has been very slow on the uptake of research ethics committees, like they exist in most other Western countries and in many Pacific states, for that matter, open data is often seen as yet another bureaucratic impediment to research freedom that is so valued by French scholars. Interest in these matters and in the process of digitization of their materials more broadly usually occurred only when uh, colleagues were directly confronted to either requests from uh, the people and communities they worked with or end of career decisions about the fate of their research archives. In both cases, uh, issues of access are of course central and so are all the concepts appearing in my word cloud, which you can see here with questions such as, for whom are archives created and conserved? Who is obliged to care for and authorize access to them? To whom do they belong? Who owns anthropological data and how uh, should it be shared? What to do with secret or sensitive information? How to deal with the protection of traditional knowledge as defined by UNESCO? And with the protection of the privacy of participants as instructed by the General Data Protection Regulation, which became enforceable in the EU in 2018. These and many other related questions raise, raise fundamental epistemological, ethical and political stakes for our discipline and for its decolonial practice in the digital era. I will briefly run through some of these issues by drawing on some Australian Indigenous examples. Indeed, uh, Australian Indigenous data and archives presents a particularly interesting borderline case to think through some of the conditions of openness of anthropological data. In Australia, uh, what can be open and what should remain closed or restricted has been the subject of complex negotiations between Indigenous communities and the institution that hold their materials uh, for several decades already. This movement results, of course, from Australia's specific post-colonial situation, uh, some aspects of which can be found in other former settler colonies, such as Aotearoa, New Zealand, Canada or the United States. It results as well from what we could gloss uh, rapidly as a national uh, reconciliation policy, policies which have been implemented since the 1990s in public institutions with various levels of recognition of uh, Indigenous continued ownership over their cultural heritage. So in museums, uh, issues, as uh, Katya mentioned, of repatriation of sacred objects and human remains, uh, restricted storages of uh, certain objects in, in special reserves, conditions of access uh, of books in libraries, uh, in universities, um, research collaborations, ethics committees, etc. The question of secrecy and its preservation uh, of access to ceremonial knowledge of, on all types of media, uh, should they be objects, artworks, anthropology records, such as photographs, films, sound recordings, film notes, is of central and very actual concern to many communities. Uh, 
This is especially the case in the central and northern regions of Australia, where ceremonial life continues to this day and represents a fundamental aspect of people's existence. In regions such as Arnhem Land, where I have worked since 2003, these materials are characterized by a relative historical depth with the arrival of the first anthropologist during the 1920s, that is, uh, soon after missionary settlements began in this region. Eight generations of Yolngu, for instance, uh, and researchers are thus represented in the Yolngu Digital Archive, which was established in Yerkala, uh, which I'll return to in a moment. So the third image on this slide is, uh, I will uh, go very quickly uh, on that. Um, sorry, my, my screen has just shut down. Um, sorry for that. Uh, so it's a model which was uh, conceived by a, a, a Yolngu elder with whom I worked for many years, Joni Banga Gumbola, uh, who was one of the leading thinkers of digitization of indigenous knowledge and collaborations with museums and anthropologists. Uh, my PhD research was uh, very much influenced by his uh, scholarship um, and the first uh, indigenous archive which uh, was created in uh, Arnhem Land. So uh, just to go very briefly over this model, you can see that it uh, uses, reproduces a traffic light uh, colors uh, with the green part, which is knowledge which is open and accessible to everybody, public knowledge, the orange part, which is restricted knowledge, which uh, you should access with care, and red, uh, the secret knowledge, uh, rest completely restricted knowledge. Um, and I will put some references to uh, some of the work around this model, which has, has been published uh, broadly and used in Joe Gumbala's work. Uh, with archives and in museums. Um, so I can't go to the next slide if... Yeah, thank you. So sensitive material, uh, rapidly uh, defined, is a categor category of objects and records that are associated with secret or sacred knowledge and rituals. It can be restricted to men or women to members of certain groups, to the exclusion of others, um, and, and more broadly speaking, uh, for museums and archives in Australia, it can also be racist or offensive uh, material, but I will not dwell, dwell on, on this uh, aspect here. Uh, many anthropological studies have shown that Australian indigenous religions and in, are indeed structured, structured around secrecy. Uh, they are revel revelatory systems of knowledge associated with specific ceremonial or other legitimate transmission settings. Unlawful exposals to these materials can be dangerous for non-indigenous non-initiated men or women, for the custodians of this knowledge and or for the people responsible for leaking or releasing this information accidentally. In many parts of Australia, um, the rituals pertaining to this secret knowledge are still practiced, as well as the complex system of rights and responsibilities that governs its access. In this context, the digitization of this type of knowledge and of materials associated with it, with it such as anthropological records, past and present, is far from a, a technical formality, however useful it may be for, the preservation, per, for preservation purposes. Uh, these digital surrogates, to take an expression from Joshua Bell, are often far from being considered open. These considerations are of utmost relevance to archivists who, as I will illustrate through a short example, face multiple demands for access and reuse of these materials they are responsible for. So to introduce this slide, uh, in 2010, I was briefly in employed by the CREM, the Centre de Recherche um, en Ethnomusicologie, uh, to index and document an imported Australian music holding of their collection. The recordings were made by well-known Australian anthropologist Adolphus Elkin from the University of Sydney during two scientific expeditions to Arnhem Land in 1949 and 1952. These recordings of the oldest music in the world, as you can see on the, on the newspaper cutting, uh, had rapidly been edited and commercialized, first as a set of 29.78 round per minute uh, phonograph records, as a, uh, considered as scientific material, and then uh, as more commercial productions, as you can see on the, on the, um, the jacket of the, of the, of the, the record here. <clears throat> 
These records contain uh, song repertoires of several neighboring Aboriginal groups, some of which are preceded by a vocal warning stating they should not be broadcasted publicly because of their secret nature. This specific holding was chosen uh, specifically uh, by my colleagues at the CREM to be digitized and made available on their online archive, specifically on the grounds that because they were recorded more than 50 years ago, they seem to satisfy the temporal criteria to enter the public domain. Uh, a, a concept in passing that is very interesting and that is challenged by uh, many indigenous groups, uh, the public domain notion. Following my work and explanation, it was of course agreed that they should not be made available online. However, uh, some years later, uh, there was a, a technical uh, glitch, uh, automatic, automated um, uh, update of the, that online uh, archive, and uh, these records uh, became available online. And a few days later, uh, my colleagues at the CREM were contacted by an Australian scholar from Australia who had uh, discovered these recordings and who had uh, written, them that, written to them to let them know that these are secret recordings, they should not be published online, and that he was going to refer it to competent authorities in Australia. So uh, I'm not sure what uh, authorities he was mentioning, maybe the community, maybe uh, the University of Sydney that holds the, the, the original recordings, but my colleagues reassured him that it was a, a, a mistake uh, and they were taken away. And as you can see here on uh, the slide uh, of the online archive, the access is uh, restricted now. So in Australia, uh, this is to say there are strict guidelines concerning indigenous materials in archives, libraries and of course museums. And uh, the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies uh, sort of sets a, a standard for access to these sorts of materials. Um, this example uh, raises the, uh, shows how uh, vigilant the Australians are uh, concerning these records and also raises the question of international ethical standards concerning these materials. Um, however, and it is important to stress, access to these materials is often requested by the what I call the source communities themselves, some of whom are developing their own uh, digital archives to host anthropological and other uh, materials from uh, the past. So, uh, if I can go, yeah. To the next slide. Uh, this is an example uh, of uh, such uh, indigenous reuse of ethnographic records. Um, it's, I mentioned uh, uh, archive, indigenous archive in the community of Yerkala in uh, northeast Arnhem Land. So um, this uh, slide talks about uh, records uh, that were made by an ethnomusicologist from the University of Illinois in the United States who uh, recorded ceremonial singing in uh, Yerkala in 1952-1953 uh, and made a number of audio tapes which he later uh, deposited to IATSIS, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, they, these tapes are accessible for consultation, uh, for public consultation, except two uh, tapes which are deemed uh, secret men's ceremonies. Uh, written permission must be obtained from the Arts Centre for access to the recordings, uh, and it's, um, it's uh, managed by the, the Bukulange Mulka Archive and Production Centre, which was created in this community uh, in 2007. So the, the recordings were repatriated to the local uh, archive um, and you can see on the photo here uh, the one of the first initiatives from the community was to edit uh, the, these songs on a CD uh, which, was, uh, which is still available for sale and another um, interesting um, development was uh, the inspiration uh, they, these songs inspired uh, a very interesting audiovisual creation, uh, the film Two Brothers at Galara in 2008. Um, so the film uses, uh, uses as narrative three songs which were recorded by Waterman in 1952, which relate the ritual resolution of a historical conflict which opposed two brothers 20 years earlier. These songs are interpreted by Binjart Kumar, which you can see on one of the photos uh, here. Uh, one of the two brothers of the story, accompanied by his nephew or classificatory son, Matolo, who is himself the narrator of the film. And that's the old man that you can see on, on, the, on the screen capture. 
So more than half a century later, Matolo presents a new interpretation of this story by reinvesting the 1952 songs and recordings and recording new songs and dances as a mode of narration. The film reconstitutes through a succession of musical se sequences the journey of two brothers across the landscape to the site of Galara, the place of their ultimate confrontation. The film is an aesthetic expression of memory, of experience of time, involving four generations of Yolngu from the Wangwari clan, one of the uh, Yolngu clan. So this is an uh, example of a legitimate reuse uh, of, of the archive when the access was granted to the archive. Um, just one point I would like to uh, raise here is the question of anonymization, which is um, which we, we, we wonder uh, about in, in, um, in uh, dealing with archives. And in, in this particular case, it's quite problematic. Uh, indeed, people insist in having their names recorded. Um, this is a significant aspect of working in archives and museum collections, redocumenting and renaming the people on the photos and the different materials. So um, let us consider now another interesting case study, the Burnt Field Notes, which uh, raises the question of who owns uh, anthropological data. So the field notes have a very uh, ambiguous status. Uh, we organized a, a workshop with uh, Monica and other colleagues around the, the specific uh, status of field notes, um, which are uh, anthropology's basic professional tool and compared by some to their most precious possession. Uh, professional anthropological associations such as the AAA or the Australian Anthropological Society recognize uh, the co-production of, um, of anthropological knowledge uh, in, in, in field notes. So to come back to, uh, rapidly to this, uh, this particular case, Ronald Burns was one of Australia's uh, leading anthropologists who was active from the 1940s to the 1980s. He founded the Department of Anthropology at the University of Western Australia, as well as the Burns Museum of Anthropology. His field notes are at the center of an ongoing controversy, which illustrates well the issues of property and co-production of anthropological data, which uh, interests me here. Four years after his death in 1990, Burns' uh, wife uh, and fellow anthropologi uh, anthropologist Catherine Burns died as well. In her will, written in 1993 and following her husband's wishes, um, it stipulated a 30-year embargo on a subset of their extensive uh, collection of paper. Papers. As it stands, the embargoed material, which is stored at the Burnt Museum of Anthropology, uh, will not be access access accessible until uh, 2024. Starting in uh, about two, uh, 2017, access to these field notes was formally requested by several Indigenous groups and individuals, descendants of uh, Burns' informants, such as Vince Copley, which you can see uh, on the photograph here, whose grandfather, uh, Barney Warrior, provided information about his people, language and culture between 1939 and 1944. Vince Copley, uh, who is now in his 80s, hopes to see these notebooks before he's, he dies. He would like to uh, uh, use them uh, uh, with his adult children to give them uh, an understanding of their uh, ancestry. Uh, so there, there, there were a number of uh, uh, publications in, in, uh, in uh, public uh, in, in, in media, uh, such as uh, an article which I quote here in the conversation, uh, raising uh, the question of who owns a family story um, and which uh, questions the embargo on, on these particular uh, materials. Um, these, uh, this group of uh, scholars, uh, archaeologists Claire Smith and others, with Vince Copley, the descendant uh, of Burns' informant, coined the expression intellectual soup to describe the reformulation of two intellectual traditions in uh, anthropological research. So as this example shows, uh, there are contradictions and conundrums in ethical positions of archiving, as is also argue, argued by David Zetlin in a, a recent article. And um, while well, he suggests uh, in his article uh, the, the solution of um, long-term embargoes on uh, anthropological data, this specific case shows that it can be very problematic for the descendants. Um, here, uh, the con uh, the, the, this controversy suggests that uh, it's not only Burnt that is the owner of the, uh, the pro intellectual property rights over these field notes, but it is also shared by his informants, who should not only be able to access these materials, but also determine its usage usages. So here we have an example of restrictions established by researchers that can be prejudicial to the informants uh, themselves.
So this is a, a, a more uh, personal uh, example uh, to, to, to emphasize how, uh, and, and Katia mentioned that also, how um, uh, making ethnographic records um, uh, and available is also something that is very emotional. Uh, it deals with very uh, hum human and emotional um, aspects of the relationship. So here you can see uh, uh, um, the, the main photo is the one on the right where you can see an old uh, woman who's my, uh, my uh, young mother who's listening on a small speaker which you can just uh, see on the, on the photo who's listened to the, listening to the voice of her deceased husband represented on the left uh, who died uh, 15 years, uh, about 15 years before uh, recording that I had made uh, in the field, so it's the first time that she can she listens to a story that he's telling, and 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 as you can see, it's it's a very um, a very strong uh, moment for her. So, um, who better than the ethnographer can uh, sh uh, know the status of their materials and decide on their fate? Uh, it's something that is. Uh, um, a, a big responsibility, uh, as well as documenting the metadata, uh, which is cu crucial in identifying uh, the, the, the situation that has been recorded. It's a very time-consuming endeavor, uh, and um, as a number of our case studies in the Anthrop Anthropon uh, project showed. So I'm just going to go very quickly on this uh, slide because I think that James Rose is going to talk more about uh, this this movement. The, the, I just want to uh, bring uh, yeah, your attention on the on the, the wording of these acronyms, uh, FAIR and CARE. Uh, I would insist uh, um, in, uh, in relation to what I just said about emotions on this CARE aspect of things, that they are very uh, meaningful uh, acronyms. So just to conclude, Include uh, briefly, um, and uh, a few references uh, that I've mentioned in my talk. Um, mindful of the open sciences movement's injunctions to open uh, our data, uh, and I quote here: "As much as possible, as little as necessary." It's something that we we have heard a lot. Um, Australian Indigenous Archives presents a particularly interesting borderline case to think through the conditions of openness of anthropological data. Uh, as I mentioned, a number of professional associations, such as the Australian Anthropological Society, uh, have uh, statements on the confidentiality of these materials and in of field notes. Um, and recognise that research participants have prior rights over their own knowledge. Um, the radical libertarian approach to information freedom, as legal scholar Susan Holcomb uh, suggests, disregards any notions of prior rights to knowledge or respect for alternative cultural protocols. Um, as stated by Tahu Kukutai and John Taylor in a landmark book on the Indigenous Data Government Movement, which James will be talking about, and I quote, open data in the context of Indigenous people is a double-edged sword. Um, Anthropologists should feel morally, ethically, and politically bound to contribute to these uh, important reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Um, you remind us that uh, the question of who owns anthropological data is still crucial. And given that this data is co-produced between anthropologists and communities, we cannot assume that everybody has the same sort of universalist ideal of open science and that we should be discussing to, with communities which might have ideas that completely differ from ours. Um, thank you also for all these examples from Australia that uh, sort of bring us to, 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 to the third intervention, which is the one of James Rose. Um, so James Rose uh, has been working for 20 years uh, with indigenous uh, Australians uh, on, on their claims to data sets, land and natural resources. And she's a senior research fellow with the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. So the floor is yours and we can come back to discuss afterwards. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. And thank you also to David and to the association for this opportunity to present. Um, thank you particularly to Jessica for reaching out. Um, we have some common contacts here in Australia who I think um, may have helped provide the, 
indication that what I might have to say is relevant for ESA um, at this time. Um, my paper will get to Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous um, data governance. Um, however, I'm going to start with a presentation on some terms and definitions uh, in relation to data governance and social anthropology uh, in order to be able to frame that discussion. But before I get started, please allow me to uh, engage in a custom which we have here in Australia, which is known as an acknowledgement of country. Uh, it involves paying our respects to the Indigenous Australians, the First Nations who are in fact the traditional owners um, of the land where we are speaking. Usually this is done in recognition that the colonial history of Australia is very short um, and there are Indigenous people in the room when these presentations are being made. So I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are in fact the traditional owners of the part of Victoria that encompasses Melbourne where I'm presenting today. On to the presentation. Uh, in the past decade, the so-called information age of the Anthropocene has entered a new phase dominated by the emergence of what we call the data economy, giving rise to a regulatory language that we refer to as data governance. Within the language of data governance, the term open data has gained significant currency, attracting both support and opposition. As a new form of social organization, the data economy is a right field site for social anthropological research questions. From what new types of social interaction is the social organization built? How are these social interactions materially mediated? What are the ideological and material consequences of this new form of social organization? As with all forms of social organization studied by us social anthropologists, the most important question is, what role do social anthropologists themselves play, given our relative positions in this new data economy? And what are the implications for our newly configured relationships with the communities and individuals with whom we work? How are their social interactions realized in this new economy? This paper outlines the key terms and definitions, as I said, that might allow us to begin answering these questions, concluding with the special case of Indigenous data. And I will see now if I'm able to move slides. Wonderful. What do we mean by data? Despite the widespread and inconsistent folk meaning, the term data has a very specific and consistent meaning across the expert fields of data science, linguistics, and social semiotics. In these contexts, data forms one of four elements in a systemic model of cognitive and intellectual work, where the other three elements are wisdom, knowledge, and information. Adding data gives us the acronym WIKD. This systemic model describes successive semiotic transformations that are applied to sensory inputs as they are acquired through human senses of sight, sound, touch, and so on, then assembled into distinct domains of experience, organized and progressively refined into increasingly concentrated semiotic states. What do we mean by semiotic states? The systemic functional linguistics and social semiotics model tells us that the creation of meaning is termed semogenesis, where social interaction between people in specific contexts using specific vocabularies and grammars gives rise to socially realized and shared meaning. From this perspective, we move from generalized experience where we use so-called everyday or natural language to realize our subconscious sensory perception of the world in the form of what might be called wisdom. Using systems of ideas that we develop in the course of our lives, distinct domains of knowledge about how to tie our shoelaces, how to make coffee, how to drive a car and so on are produced. From this point, we then generally begin to develop specialized languages for describing specialized domains of experience that are outside of the everyday realm, usually in the course of formal education. These languages have their own sets of vocabularies and grammars, for example, for music, for art, for religion, and so on. Using these specialized languages, we are able to collect information 
such as about different genres of music, different art movements, different branches of religion. Thus, we move from wisdom to knowledge and then from knowledge to information. These three elements are all part of everyday life for all people. This is because all human languages have the semogenic power to realize meaning in this way. And all social cultures depend upon that semogenic power in order to sustain human life. You may notice that data is not included in this account. Where does data fit into this model of semogenesis? In truth, humans have not really needed data until the last couple of centuries. Data is something that we have invented by disassembling our own natural languages through the development of formal analytical, technical languages, such as linguistics, such as semiotics, and such as mathematics, until we yield countable lexemes, or what might be referred to as unit level data. Why would we do this? As with most major transformations in human social organization, there is a fundamental underlying economic logic, which, if not the original cause of the innovation that sparked the transformation, is the logic that sustains it. As we understand very well here in the Anthropocene, where the very existence of life on Earth hinges on the continuity of our current form of economic organization, material limitations on social transformations determine whether those transformations persist over time or are extinguished. And data certainly does persist. The explosion of the data economy in the early 2000s was recognized by the World Economic Forum in a 2011 report referring to the emergence of a new asset class, which classifies data as a form of intangible asset comparable with other forms of intangible asset, such as intellectual property, and is subject to the same financial dynamics as tangible assets like commodities, real estate, and machinery. Most importantly, the WEF classification recognizes data as the product of cognitive and intellectual work to which one or a combination of individuals contribute. The recognition by the World Economic Forum, together with other international financial regulatory bodies, that data is generated by people engaging in work has allowed a formal reconfiguration in the way that data is governed internationally, especially in the retail market, which is dominated by the tech giants, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Apple, and so on, and by governments, including government-funded research organizations, such as universities. It is now understood that so-called social media is in fact a form of data farming, where users provide data, usually personal, to these web platforms in exchange for various kinds of telecommunication and other information management services. Similarly, governments collect vast quantities of data in the form of census records, driving and other forms of licensing, health records, tax records, and so on, in exchange for the provision of a range of essential services. Most importantly, the recognition that data is a form of asset that belongs at least partly to the people who create it has allowed some international governmental jurisdictions to introduce legislation for enshrining and protecting those property rights. What do we mean by data governance? All systems of governance comprise three elements, including roles, functions, and relations, where roles are named and allocated to individuals and organizations, functions are attached to those roles, relations link roles to one another via the functions that they perform. Governance systems generally operate as a means to distributing goods and services across a population with the objective of maintaining, promoting, or reducing certain configurations of social organization. As noted above, the primary significance of data in a data economy is as a form of asset, which can be generated, stored, processed, and exchanged 
data governance in this context is therefore oriented towards the distribution of data as an asset across a population where the roles, functions and relations of the governance system bear upon configurations of the data economy. Most contemporary data governance regimes incorporate three roles known as owner, custodian and steward, each of which is accompanied by corresponding sets of functions and relations. This OCS model of data governance may be characterized as shown in this diagram. Data owners determine all purposes for which and the means by which a data asset is generated, stored, accessed, processed, and finally destroyed. Data custodians supply data storage and access services on behalf of a data owner, while data stewards supply data processing services, including destruction, again, on behalf of a data owner. Excuse my cat, please. The roles, functions and relations that constitute systems of data governance all contribute to the structure of what is referred to as a data life cycle. As suggested by the term, a data life cycle describes the processes to which data is subjected between the points of its generation and destruction. Models of life cycles confer a temporal order on the OCS data governance model described above. In other words, they give direction to the flow of processes via the functions and relations between the roles of data owner, custodian, and steward. In this image, we see an integration of this temporal ordering into the model of systemic governance described above as the OCS model. Data life cycles generally span a chain of events, commencing with data generation in the first instance, various phases of storage, access and processing, and finally, destruction. The attribute of data provenance, i.e. a model of the history of a given unit of data, is critically dependent upon a coherent and self-consistent life cycle model. In other words, we cannot understand where data has come from or who owns it, much less how to ensure its ownership rights are respected properly without building a clear model of its life cycle. Within the realm of data governance, there exist further more specialized mechanisms for managing risks posed to data economy stakeholders. Risk management models are typically premised on an OCS governance model and are oriented towards the functions of each of the three roles described in that model. Therefore, data owners, for data owners, any risk to their capacity to determine the purposes for which and the means by which a data asset is generated, stored, accessed, processed or destroyed is notionally protected by such a mechanism. Meanwhile, for custodians, data storage and access risks are mitigated while for stewards, mitigation is aimed at risks associated with processing and destruction. What is social anthropological data? As with all dimensions of social anthropological theory and practice, the definition of the term data is hotly contested within our field. In order to reduce the number of points of disagreement, however, we may generalize a more widely acceptable definition by making the following high level propositions. Social anthropology involves the collection of two kinds of information. Information about people's social interactions and information about the systems of ideas that people use to explain their social interactions. These two types of information are usually collected within defined parameters, delimited by one or a collection of regions in space and time. Therefore, the information that social anthropologists collect is usually also accompanied by spatio-temporal metadata, i.e. the locations and times at which it was collected. 
Note that I refer here to information rather than data. This is because the structure of the information that we social anthropologists collect is not necessarily in the form of data at the point of collection. In other words, it may not consist of countable unit level records. Rather, it consists of our observations of people's interactions with one another, as well as their own explanations of those interactions. Given the conventions of our field, the information that we collect is more likely to be in the form of field notes or audio or video recordings, as Jessica so well demonstrated. In order to take the next step, though, in developing a broadly acceptable definition of social anthropological data, we may ask ourselves how our specialized language, the language of social anthropology, allows us to disassemble this information into data. In other words, what is contained in that information that could be called data? The first answer is, of course, people. People have names. People have ages, places of birth, and various other attributes and experiences. The second answer is social relationships. This means people talking about other people with whom they interact in some way. Those other people have names too, as well as their own attributes and experiences. And finally, the third answer is types of social interaction. This means people talking about similarities and differences in their interactions with other people to the extent that they begin to organize sets of people according to the types of interaction that they have with them. For example, friends, family, teachers, colleagues, language community members, ceremonial participants, and so on. Given that it is very likely that we can all agree on these very general propositions, we might also agree that social anthropological data carries these generalized characteristics irrespective of which individuals or communities we work with and irrespective of our various theoretical and methodological approaches. With regard to the OCS model of data governance above, we must ask ourselves whether we are engaging in one or a combination of data ownership, custodianship, and or stewardship roles in the course of undertaking social anthropological research. We must also ask ourselves how participants in this research are represented by such a governance model. Of course, research participants must be data owners too, at least in part since without their cognitive and intellectual work, field information and the data that it encodes could not be generated. With regard to the data life cycle, the first question should be, when and how is social anthropological data first generated? Since both research participant and anthropologist are involved, generation must occur at the point in space and time when interaction occurs. But since the research participant is the one bringing the information that the anthropologist then records, they must logically be the primary stakeholder in that generation process. After that point, however, it is the anthropologist who takes on the role of custodian and steward, since it is in the field notes and audio and video recordings that the data is encoded. And it is the anthropologist who effectively decides how that stored data is accessed and processed, even how and when it may ultimately be destroyed. With regard to risk, the overarching question we must ask ourselves is, how is social anthropological data to be made safe? And for whom is it safe? Who is at risk from its generation, storage, processing and destruction? The answer to this question depends very much on the relative positions of the social anthropologist and the research participant within the encompassing data economy. What is open data? The principles of open data are oriented by a desire to make the data economy fairer. They originate from a risk management standpoint in which the primary risk to a fairer economy is posed by established powerful cliques within the economy 
which might further consolidate and expand their market share at the expense of communities and individuals who have little or no share in the data economy. Risk management in this context is treated as a means of managing the functions of and relationships between each of the roles in an OCS governance model. Because of the regulatory monopoly of governments, open data principles tend to be oriented towards governments and government funded bodies. The most widely accepted definition of open data, which aligns with the International Open Data Charter and the UK based Open Knowledge Foundation, incorporates eight key principles. That data must be freely accessible, freely shareable, complete, timely, interoperable, primary, modifiable, and fully open. As mentioned at the outset of this talk, the proposition that data should be open by default is either supported or opposed by each of various types of stakeholder, depending primarily on their relative economic position. However, ideology about distribution of goods and services across a population complicates what would otherwise be a straightforward prediction in which those in control of existing assets seek to consolidate that control while those without control seek to gain it. Some governments welcome data, open data, typically on the basis of the understanding that openness renders research and development of more effective policies and programs more effective and efficient, promoting innovation and economic growth. Conversely, other governments oppose open data on the grounds that their prior investments in generating data should deliver a financial return in the form of fees and charges for data access. At worst, some governments seek to conceal data for policy reasons, such as alliance to certain private industry partners or for military or other alleged security reasons. Similar contradictions exist among stakeholders in the data economy who would, on the face of it, seem more likely to support open data. Civil society advocates are one such example, for whom support for the principle of open data is generally a default position. The motivation for supporting open data for civil society groups is that a key component of open and transparent government in which citizens play a maximal role is one in which citizens are able to freely access the data that governments collect both about them as individuals and on behalf of them as their representatives. However, there is frequently a contradictory position advocated by such groups where competing principles, such as those of privacy, give rise to an opposition to open data. In this scenario, data economy stakeholders who are already marginalized view themselves as at risk of further marginalization as a consequence of better organized stakeholders moving ahead of them. Such marginal stakeholders counterintuitively advocate for selective protections for subsets of data asset classes in which they claim a particular ownership stake that they otherwise are not able to exercise. Now, where does Indigenous data fit in this picture? Indigenous data is data that is generated either in whole or in part by Indigenous individuals and communities. Definition of data as Indigenous is contingent on that data operating within an economy alongside non-Indigenous data. More specifically, Indigenous data is that which is generated by individuals or communities that preceded in space-time the existence of other non-Indigenous individuals and communities. In terms of data governance, this data will have an inherent life cycle that commences in a region of space-time prior to other classes of data and which persists because of the intergenerational persistence of Indigenous communities themselves. Indigenous data is also a class of data that is exposed to the distinctive forms of risk as a consequence of its exposure to the data economy via political processes that originate in colonial administrative exploitation of Indigenous individuals and communities and their property. As discussed above, data is just such a form of property. There remains a trailing edge of social anthropology's colonial administrative origins, which means 
that Indigenous communities are still overrepresented among social anthropological research participants. This means that where Indigenous data is generated as a consequence of social anthropological research, social anthropologists have a primary responsibility to support the exercise of Indigenous data ownership by those communities and individuals who are responsible for generating that data in the first instance. Because of these distinctive features of Indigenous data, the principles of open data require additional caveats when applied to such data. This is not an irreconcilable conflict, but rather one that can be addressed through the rubric of the OCS model of data governance described above, starting with the assumption that Indigenous individuals are in fact the owners of Indigenous data, either wholly or partly. The governance of Indigenous data in a setting where open data principles are also desirable means that the orientation to open data must be one in which Indigenous data ownership is prioritised above the interests of all other stakeholders. And so, in conclusion, the features of Indigenous data that make it distinctive, i.e. its pre- and post-colonial life cycle and its specific risk exposure mark it apart from classes of data generated by other communities of people distinguishable from each other by distinct personal attributes and types of social interactions and by distinct systems of ideas used for explaining that social interaction. As such, social anthropological data is always owned by other people to some extent. And those people always have an interest in determining how social anthropologists act as custodians and as stewards of that data, even when in many cases, social anthropologists may also be co-owners as a consequence of their collaborative role in its generation. All social anthropological data, including Indigenous data, has a distinctive life cycle that incorporates a given social anthropologist at the specific point in time when the data was collected. And all social anthropological data bears a distinctive risk exposure profile according to the political circumstances of the individuals and communities who participate in its generation. With regard to the implications of open data principles, social anthropologists should always give regard to the position within the data economy of those individuals and communities with which they are working. Are these positions secure? Are they based on previously existing stakes in the data economy? Or on the other hand, are these positions vulnerable? Do they originate from a marginalized basis? Are they still marginalized? Most importantly, what are the relative positions of the social anthropologists and research participants within the data economy? Self-evidently, the answer to this question will vary according to research participants' communities of origin. Social anthropology conducted with ruling or middle-class professionals will yield a very different set of answers to these questions than that conducted with Indigenous communities and individuals. Thank you, Monica and David. Thank you very much, James. Um, so many questions and, and um, uh, a big thank you because uh, by modeling a bit, uh, we have you have drawn our attention to the fact that the question of ownership, of course, is not the only one. Um, and uh, the data life cycles and the data risks. The question of data risk is very much discussed because we always discuss about how can we uh, protect our informants and in the same time share the material. And we had in 2018 two contradictory European laws, one that is um, obliging us to protect the data to such point that anthropologists are afraid that they can't publish anymore. And another one that says that we should be sharing the data. So there is much discussion about that. But the question of data life cycles and, and what you mentioned, the fact that we have to, to pay attention to the position within the data economy. Uh, this is something that, well, personally, I haven't been confronted to that, not working on indigenous people and, and putting that in a broader framework that sort of allows us to, to speak all the same sort of language uh, somehow and look at it analytically. So thank you very much. And um, David, maybe we should open the floor for everybody to ask questions. I don't know whether they are 
uh, there, there is much time for for this, given uh, that those are wonderful three pr presentations. So. Yeah, no, I, I thank you all very much. I mean, they all spoke to each other and provide us with such a lot of thinking to do. Um, and, and you know, um, you've given us given us great resources and examples as well. And um, we, we really would invite questions either in the um, in the question box, which we can spotlight you, or you can just um, come up and ask a question directly um, on stage. Um, we have not very long, unfortunately, yes. but um, I mean, while we're waiting, can I can I ask one question to you, James? You, you, you presented this incredibly powerful and useful model, and and given us this sense of why indigenous data is particularly unique because of the marginality of of the participants within that data economy. Um, I mean, I guess it speaks to all of, all of all of the, the presenters really. But how does one how does one know in advance how marginal another community might be? Such that you know you, you're isolating particularly the and indigenous communities, which is right. Um, when and how does one judge when that would apply? Because that, that does require a sort of moral judgment from the start, doesn't it? Yes. No. Look, it's a very good question, David. I think most of us in preparing to do field work already have some uh, idea about the community with which we are engaging. If the community is diverse, then we will have some kind of a expectation about the profile of that diversity so that we understand the relative um, vulnerability or security of the people inside the community from a socioeconomic perspective. But if we take, for example, the community where I grew up uh, in the central desert in Australia um, in the 1980s and 1990s, this is one of the poorest and most marginalized indigenous uh, communities in Australia. People don't speak English, they have no education. Um, quite different to the Yolngu community where Jessica works, who um, are actually quite famous in Australia. <laughs> they're very strong and very well organized and a very powerful economy and so forth. But I think this would be something that would be a critical part of preparation for field work to get a sense um, of, the, of the security or vulnerability of the community with which we're working. That's, that's really helpful. Show your attention, uh, Anne Lavanchi. We brought you on stage so that you can ask directly your question. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot to, to, to you for the speeches. Um, I'm, I'm also working with indigenous people in South America there, uh, and, and also with so-called, uh, to do quickly migrant people. And I'm wondering how we can, uh, use all what you have said and what maybe with the practices we have built together with indigenous organizations, uh, which are normally or usually not not always but organizations so you have like representative people you can discuss with about what can be shared how something could be shared or should not be shared and when we are working with other kinds of marginalized people such as illegalized uh, migrant people uh it's very complicated i'm trying to do so and i don't have answers and and trying also to to discuss uh with people about these issues but well there are like face-to-face uh, -face discussions or person-to-person -person discussions but without maybe some collective thinking about what is ethical and and how we can do this so it's, i don't know it's not a question it's just an, e an open issue and open questions i have uh, in my um, research pieces. Thank you. If I just may ask, uh, uh, there is a question actually. <laughs> I don't know whether there is a joke <laughs> or a question from Jennifer Spares who said that we should be leaving instructions in our wheels about what should be done with our old but still useful material. And I don't know whether you do have this sort of um, a juridical knowledge to, to answer this question. Um, or is this is still to be established, and this is something that we should be discussing all together, and and inform our those who govern us. Jessica, I think because of your experience with IATSIS. Thanks for the questions. Um, as I said at the beginning of my talk, I don't have. Uh, 
answers or solutions uh, to <laughs> to offer. Uh, these are very complex issues. I think that each field side is completely different. Uh, there's not one solution that would you know be uh, applicable for all of us. Um, that's where I think the ethics come in, and uh, I know it, it's something that has been uh, criticised a lot in recent years in, in, in different uh, publications, the, the whole ethical process, such as it can exist in Australia, for instance. Um, but the, the, the positive things, uh, as James said uh, about that, is that it, it obliges you to think about these issues before you go to the field. So when you go to the field, um, in Australia anyway, uh, you have to, to go through this uh, ethics clearance from the university when you get uh, funding from an orga organisation such as uh, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. You have to comply to a number of rules that are very clearly um, stated and that you have to, uh, you know, you have to sign up for it. Uh, and it's the, the, the positive thing is that you, you have to think about that. You have to think about the, the photographs that you will take. What are you going to do with these photographs? Who will be able to access them? Um, and, and it's a way to yeah, think in advance about these issues and not arrive at retirement time when, uh, as I mentioned in, in, in my talk, when uh, that's when uh, most of our colleagues will think, well, what should I do with all my research material? Um, and uh, usually it's once they are retired that they will have enough time because it's a very time, and I insist on that, it's a very time-consuming uh, con uh, uh, endeavour uh, to document things in, in, in a, an appropriate way uh, so that people in the future, uh, including the descendants of the people you have worked with, but also colleagues who, who might work in the same area, uh, can actually use that uh, data or, or, well, data, of course, is not, <laughs> it's a complicated term, but, uh, you know, photographs and, and things like that. So, yes, I'm sorry, I don't have a, 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 an answer that would, you know, be useful for, for everybody because it's, I think it's up to us as uh, field workers to actually consider these issues uh, before going to the field and maybe discuss them uh, once you're there. Uh, obviously, circumstances are very different. Uh, I worked uh, in, a, in an area where people were very interested, uh, and that's why the Australian example is so is so interesting. And it's, I mean, it's we have three uh, scholars here talking about things. I mean, uh, Katya also is, uh, if I understand well, has a, 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 a position or, uh, in, in Australia or, or research funding in Australia. I mean, it's a country that is well in advance on some of these uh, issues because it's been happening for the past, I mean, people have been thinking about things such as repatriation for the past 30 years. Um, and we are just asking ourselves these questions uh, in Europe uh, now, I mean, in, the, in recent years. Um, yes, um, just to complete also, because it seems that I presented the question on the wheel as not being um, a serious concern for us and I, I do hope that the state of health of everybody allows us not to have to draw our wheels right now uh, but the question of data life cycles you are mentioning seem to be um, quite Im impossible somehow to to, to master because it, it, it's a sort of control over the future and the future developments of how uh, vulnerable or not and how secure and not some of the things are so so we are here in a, in a posture we never had uh, but probably in our archivists and museum curators know much more about this, but we, we haven't thought about the future so, so much. Um, so somebody tried to speak and, and I just covered, so, so sorry. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to add something um, from the kind of like broadening that from the um, indigenous perspective, um, because I've been working in India a lot. Um, and when it comes to the museums, it's more like with the elite that you're working with, right? Um, so people engaged in museums and institutions usually, I mean, of course, they reproduce um, colonial, um, you know, colonial customs, etc. But the thing is, even within these museums, like that one example that I brought up, where the Ministry of Culture funded the digitization of 10 major um, museums, so even within these museums, the directors had very different um, takes on that process of making these data available because while one was very um, enthusiastic saying, you know, all of a sudden I can connect to my kind of co-directors in other parts of the country and I can see what they have in their collections. 
someone else said, see, why do we as India now have to be at the forefront to making all that stuff accessible? Whereas other countries that also have Indian heritage, like, you know, Great Britain, Germany, France, you name it, they are really, you know, slow and think about whether they make that accessible. So, so this kind of structural disadvantage does not only regard indigenous people, but it also regards the kind of divide that we still have and the digital gap between the, what we call the global north and the global south. Um, so that also, I think, plays a role when we think about who actually owns data, who should invest what kind of money, who should be allowed to, de to determine what is accessible and what not. So it's more like an add on to that to broaden that perspective um, and for everyone working with whatever um, community um, to, to take into account and then make these careful decisions. Um, who's an owner, who's a custodian, etc. Um, just to let you know that um, it, it, it's a bit late and, and probably very, very late for James uh, in, in, in Melbourne. So um, uh, David, I don't know whether you Maybe we should bring that to a conclusion. I mean, I, we can spend days probably discussing about some of those things. Some of them need to settle also so that we can c come up with new models. Um, but maybe we should be stopping here right now. Uh, thanking you so much for your engagement and, and your wonderful presentation, saying that uh, they have been recorded. So they are going to be uh, online available to those who contacted us, saying that they can't attend at this particular time of the day, uh, but who are going to watch some afterwards. So thank you so much. Yes, and thank you all for coming. I think this is a really important debate for us all. So we shall go away and think more about this. Thanks, my, uh, Monica, for organizing and James. Thank you so much, everyone. See you. Bye. 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 Bye, -bye.